Julian Burnside, thank you for your time this morning. What is your view on whether asylum seekers who live in Australian communities should also be able to work in those communities? Um, I, well, I think they plainly should be able to. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the restriction on work includes a restriction on voluntary work. Work is defined in the Migration Act as including unpaid work. And the point of denying a person the right to do any work of any sort, whether paid or not, is not only about driving them into poverty, but also about denying them the, the simple dignity of being able to be useful. Um, I, in my view, the idea of preventing people from working is simply uh, is barbarous. The view taken by the Immigration Minister in his discussion here yesterday seemed to be that he would undermine the no advantage policy that the government's been running for 11 months if he were to offer people work and effectively encourage more people to take to boats. Does he have a point or not? Look, I, I don't actually agree with that. If you look at the, um, if you look at the pattern of boat arrivals over the last a uh, couple of years, you'll see that they run in parallel with global movements of refugees. It's not that there are suddenly uh, pull factors which are making Australia look terribly attractive. In fact, if you want to test that, look at the fact that uh, since the introduction of the reintroduction of the Pacific Solution, the rate of arrivals has actually increased. Now, first time round, when the Pacific Solution came along and the boats stopped, people said the Pacific Solution stopped the boats. By the same logic, the Pacific Solution second time has increased the boats. An alternative way of looking at it is to say, well, actually, maybe it's not about us. Maybe it's about things that are happening in the places where people are escaping from. And if you take that view, well, then for us to treat people harshly is simply to say, well, let's assume they come here because they think Australia looks like a nice place. Let's make Australia look as unpleasant as possible so that they would rather stay and face the Taliban than come to Australia and take their chances. The reality is that people risk their lives trying to get here. They do that because they are escaping danger. And, you know, in the last 15 years, about 90% or 95% of boat people have turned out to be genuine refugees. Whereas the people who come here by plane over that same time, only about 20% of them turn out to be refugees. Of course, the, the uh, move to allow them to work in Australian communities might also antagonise some people in those communities who, with that long-held suspicion about foreign workers taking jobs of Australians. How do you believe that would play out in Australian communities were your plan put into action? Well, I actually think uh, that that is a concern that wouldn't be realised at all. See, the, what I would propose is that when people arrive without papers and so on, they should be detained initially. I think that's fair enough. But I would cap that initial detention at one month for preliminary health and security checks. That's a reasonable uh, precaution that any country could take. After that, I'd say, pending the balance of their refugee processing, release them into the community, let them work, give them access to Centrelink benefits and Medicare benefits, but until they are determined to be refugees or not to be refugees require that they live in specified rural or regional towns. Now, if, if that were put into place, then all of those people would be taking, let's say, Centrelink money into rural or regional towns. They'd be spending it on rent, on food, on clothing. All of that would go into local communities and would actually create jobs. Um, you know, the fact is that it's population that creates work. Um, and there are plenty of rural towns that are quietly dying because the population is leaving and who'd be very pleased to have an injection of population, especially population who brings some money with them. Last night, the Foreign Affairs Minister Bob Carr told ABC TV that the government has advice that overwhelmingly the new flood of asylum seekers is coming from Iran and overwhelmingly they are people seeking economic gain, uh, not refugees in the traditional sense, escaping persecution or danger. Do you accept that the modern asylum seeker is increasingly after economic gain and not the refugee as we once understood them to be? Uh, no, I, I think Mr. Senator Carr is talking through his hat. And frankly, I think it's disgraceful that a Minister of the Crown should let fly with ideas like that when he has absolutely no facts at all to support his view. He knows that uh, up until August of last year, for the previous 15 years or so, more than 90% 
of boat people have turned out to be genuine refugees when assessed by our system applying the uh, standard in the Migration Act. Since August of last year, no asylum claims have been processed. He has no facts at all on which to say, uh, you know, what sort of claim for refugee status people have had who've come here in the last what, 10 months. But he does know that more than 90% before that were genuine refugees. Now, I, frankly, I think he's just being a bigot. He just is saying this because he wants to help harden community attitudes uh, against the idea of offering protection to people who come here at great peril in order to seek safety. With that said, what do you say of Bob Carr's claim that there is never justification for asylum seekers burning their passports en masse or repeating identically rehearsed stories of persecution that the other 30, 40 or 50 on the same vessel have repeated? Do you, do you agree that that is uh, what we're seeing and, that, uh, and do you think there is ever justification for those things to happen? Um, first, I think there's no justification for those things happening. Second, I have no evidence that those things do happen. Um, the, especially people coming from Iran, most of the people who come from Iran or have done over the last 15 years have been unable to get papers. They're not allowed to leave Iran. They leave illegally uh, because they are enemies of the typically the, the uh, theocracy that runs the place. Those people leave Iran at great risk and they can't get papers because the, what happens in repressive states, and maybe Senator Carr hasn't noticed this, what happens in repressive states is that the state does not allow its enemy to have papers. You know, they make it hard for people to leave. Now, uh, you know, Carr can say whatever he wants, but the fact is he does not have evidence to support his assertions and it sounds very much like dog whistle politics uh, in order to make community attitudes hardened against people who risk their lives to get here to safety. So on the other side of politics, what did you think when you heard Scott Morrison's suggestion of the possible use of SAS troops again uh, in the seas to the north of Australia to turn back asylum boats under a coalition government's policy? Well, if he wants to engage in international piracy, I suppose that's a matter for him. Um, uh, his attitudes to the treatment of asylum seekers and mine are, I think, irreconcilably different. Just how much trouble do you judge Australia's immigration system to be in at the moment? Um, it's it's labouring under the strain at the moment, but that's a self-inflicted wound. Uh, if we were to adopt a system along the lines that I've suggested, I think the strain on the system would disappear straight away. And incidentally, um, it's not widely known in the community that our present approach to asylum seekers is costing us something like $3 billion a year, um, and about 90% of that is wasted. 90% of that is caused by our mad determination to make ourselves look even nastier than the Taliban uh, by locking people up and making it so horrible that um, other people will not bother coming and asking for our help if they know what they face when they get here. And that's a big if. if. Uh, so I don't, th I don't think the system is in a crisis uh, beyond what it's caused for itself. How much of the uh, causes of the, the original causes of the problem go down to Kevin Rudd's move five years ago away from um, offshore processing, then widely applauded, but of course now um, scorned by the opposition, and even uh, some concessions from Kevin Rudd and his immigration minister that that was a mistake? Well, uh, views can differ on this, but I do not think that pull factors have any, any significant part to play in boat arrivals. Um, you know, if you look at the history of boat arrivals in Australia, you do see that they track pretty much in parallel with global movements of refugees. Um, I think there's this sort of strange vanity in the Australian community that says, well, this is such a fabulous place. Well, of course, anyone wanting to move to another country would want to come here. The fact is, if, for example, you're a Hazara from Afghanistan or Pakistan, and more than half the refugees in the last 15 years have been uh, Hazaras, um, if you're a Hazara uh, coming from Afghanistan or Pakistan, the likelihood is you have never even heard of Australia. And the fact is, that the cheapest place to escape to is Australia. It's more expensive for a, for a Hazara to get to Europe and more expensive again for them to get to America. So they end up coming here in pretty small numbers. They end up coming here 
uh, because we're the cheapest. Not, not because we're the nicest, but because we're the cheapest. Julian Burnside, to close, what uh, uh, threats do you see, if threats is the right word, um, of possible future legal action or legal fights emerging over our immigration system, given the way both our government and opposition are talking about taking policy? Oh, they're inevitable, and they're happening already, because we know, the government knows, just how much it harms people by the way it treats them in immigration detention. And there have been lots and lots of successful uh, civil claims for damages brought by people who, as it turns out, were genuine refugees, who, as it turns out, were mistreated in immigration detention, who, who as it turns out, have been disabled for life by the treatment they received at our hands. Uh, it's one of the hidden costs associated with our mistreatment of refugees. And it's rather sad, you know, it's quite interesting to think, uh, Tim, when you reflect on the fact that uh, uh, last, in the financial year just finished, the total number of boat people who got to Australia was just short of 25,000. And the media and the politicians treated that as though it was a crisis. By global standards, it's a tiny number. By our standards, it's a manageable number. Back in the late 70s, we received 25,000 boat people from Indochina each year for a few years, but it was done with bipartisan support between Fraser and Whitlam, and there was no social concern at all. Economically, it didn't harm us, it didn't cause unemployment, and the sky remains in place. Frankly, that's the sort of country we can be. I think that's the sort of country we ought to be. And the idea that we're turning ourselves into a country that will demonise and brutalise innocent people who are fleeing for safety is something which, frankly, uh, none of us should want a part of. They are, the politicians are now eroding the national character of this country and overseas we are regarded as heartless and mean. Julian Burnside, thank you for coming on Breaking Politics this morning. Thank you.